All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you were able to get a cookie and some coffee. Um, so we'll just reconvene. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to our third and final panel titled Future Provocations. My name is Yinchi Lermontan. I'm Associate Curator of American Art here at the Huntington. And um, it's really an honor to be here with all of you, with colleagues, and also um, with a number of my, my own mentors uh, who have been presenting and speaking today, including Marcy Kwan um, and Jeff Chang, who will be on the upcoming panel. As an art historian, <laughs> I would like to introduce this panel to you through two images. Um, so you're seeing here on the left a color lithograph by the Hawaiian-born Japanese-American abstract expressionist Tetsuo Ochikubo. In it, a small pitch black hole punctures a bright yellow field which emanates around it, and above it, a feathery black and charcoal kind of being hovers. Um, and on the right, you may, if anyone's a, a Pacific Northwestie or a Seattleite, you may recognize this sculpture by Isama Noguchi, um, his monumental black granite sculpture called Black Sun, which is installed in Volunteer Park in 1969. And it actually um, remains there near the, the city's Asian Art Museum. Uncorroborated, uncorroborated urban legend uh, has speculated that Soundgarden's 1994 grunge hit Black Hole Sun took its inspiration from Noguchi's sculpture. And again, that is purely internet urban legend. <laughs> um, but for the grungies out there, I thought I would note that. Um, and I myself have been wondering for the past year if the spinning black everything bagel and everything everywhere all at once is somehow channeling this sculpture. So I use these two artworks to pose the central question of this particular panel, which is, how can we imagine Asian American futures? To me, Ochikubo and Noguchi's works, both made during the American atomic age and post Hiroshima, during a period which has been discussed several times today of burgeoning Asian American consciousness and movements, conjure a kind of Asian American futurism. Made in a moment of yellow power supporting black power, um, these works perhaps take a page from the tenets of Afrofuturism, building on Sun Ra's call that space is the place to ask whether there is an Asian outer spatial imaginary that could inform how we dream and also how we organize political movements here on planet Earth. So um, we've asked the members of this panel a kind of difficult question, but they're all leaders in their fields of law, policy, design and culture, and we've asked them to present a provocation or a kind of meditation, a shorter presentation um, about the future of Asian America and California and beyond from their respective uh, areas of expertise. So after a short provocation by each panelist, we're going to have a discussion about um, Asian American political futures, electoral futures, and also cultural, cultural imagination, possibilities and narratives. And we really invite participation from the audience in this section. Um, so feel free to raise your hands um, and actively kind of engage with members of the panel. OK. Um, so I'd like to introduce the illustrious members of the panel, beginning with Manjusha Kulkarni. Uh, Manjusha Kulkarni is executive director of the AAPI Equity Alliance, um, which serves and represents 1.6 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the LA County area. In March 2020, Manju co-founded co Stop AAPI Hate, the nation's leading aggregator of COVID-19 hate-related incidents against AAPIs. For her leadership, Manju has been recognized with many honors, including as one of times most influential people and Forbes 50 over 50 for this work. And she has published widely in the New York Times, NPR, and CNN. And she, um, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> as many know, I'm quite pregnant. So I'm having a little breathing difficulty <laughs> up here. Um, but I, um, you know, I don't want to butcher these bios because the members of, these um, of this panel are really amazing. So bear with me as I'm trying to breathe through this. 
Um, so she uh, serves on the board of directors of LA Voice and is a member of the LA City Ethics Commission and the California Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board. She shared her expertise with places like the UN um, and the Aspen Institute and the World Bank. Uh, the second speaker is Jimenez Lai, who was born in Taiwan. He grew up in Canada and he lives in Los Angeles. Before establishing Bureau Spectacular, Lai lived in a desert shelter in Tai Li Sin and resided in a shipping container in Atelier Van Leeshout on the piers of Rotterdam, which I'm really hoping he'll tell us about. Um, his first book is called Citizens of No Place, an architectural graphic novel, and it was published by Princeton Architectural Press with a grant from the, Gr grant from the Graham Foundation. He's won various awards, including Architectural League Prize for Young Architects, a debut award at the Lisbon Triennial, and the designer of the future at Art Basel. Um, Lai represented Taiwan at the 14th Venice Architectural Biennale, and his work is in the permanent collection of places including MoMA, uh, SF MoMA, Art Institute of Chicago, and LACMA. Karen Wang is executive director of the Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy at the UCLA School of Law, and she has advocated for civil rights and immigrant rights for more than 20 years. She was vice president of programs and communications at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which we've heard a little bit about today already, where she oversaw litigation, legal services, policy advocacy, pro bono, and communication strategies. She has directed the Advancing Justice LA Immigrant Rights Project, helping secure benefits for low-income and limited English-speaking immigrants, and served as Deputy Regional Manager for Civil Rights Office of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She has served on numerous boards um, and received many honors, including the Alumni Award from Berkeley Law and from other organizations, including Lambda Legal, and has published widely and been interviewed widely. Um, and uh, last but not least, we will be hearing from Jeff Chang, who has written extensively on culture, politics, arts, and music. His first book, um, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, History of the Hip Hop Generation, won tens of awards, and his other volumes um, are Total Chaos, Art and Aesthetics of Hip Hop, Who We Be, The Colorization of America, and We Gon't Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation. Um, and that book was hailed as the Washington Post's smartest book of the year. His next project is a cultural biography, which I'm super excited for, uh, called Water Mirror, Mirror Echo, Bruce Lee and the Making of Asian America. Jeff, Jeff has received many honors. He's been a Ford Fellow in Literature, um, Frederick Douglass 200, and he's written for The Guardian, New York Times, et cetera, and been featured in the um, PBS documentary about Asian Americans, which many of you may have seen. Most recently, he served as senior advisor at Race Forward, where he leads the Butterfly Lab for Immigrant Narrative Strategy, and he was formerly the Vice President of Narrative Arts and Culture, um, there and Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity Arts at Stanford. So please join me in welcoming our first esteemed panelist, Manju Kulkarni. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you to Yin Chi for that generous and kind introduction and to the Huntington for um, inviting me to participate in this wonderful day of conversation and, and to really be alongside so many thought leaders, um, Jeff, Jimenez, and Karen, um, whom I've known for a long time, uh, really leaders in this space who've had among the most thoughtful approaches to what our communities have experienced. Um, so for me, the topic of future provocations is about resistance and resilience. How are Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders responding to hate? Uh, and in order to understand um, and answer that question, we need to know what our communities have experienced. Uh, as Yin Chi mentioned, our organization, uh, AAPI Equity Alliance, which is a coalition here in Los Angeles, 
co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, along with Chinese for Affirmative Action and San Francisco State University in 2020, when we began to see the emergence of COVID-19 related hate um, across our state, here in LA, as well as in Northern California. Um, and so we set up the website, the reporting center, and within just a few weeks, we got several hundred incident reports. And you see here, three of these are direct quotes from individuals who've reported to us. Um, the first on the top being a case of workplace discrimination. The next one um, here, a case of physical assault. Uh, over here on the right-hand corner, an adult child reporting what his elderly parents experienced in their own neighborhood. And then this one here on the left um, is really how we started our work, which is um, a child in Los Angeles at a LA Unified School was physically attacked and verbally assaulted on the schoolyard in early February before there was a single confirmed case of COVID-19 in Southern California. Another child approached him and said, hey, you're a COVID carrier, go back to China. Um, he was not Chinese American and he reflexively said, you know, I'm not Chinese. Uh, and when he said that, he was punched in the face and had 20 times. Um, and so we immediately got into action. We worked with the family to make sure their needs were being addressed. And we also then held a press conference with local leaders to say that we would not tolerate this behavior. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, within a few weeks, we got several hundred incident reports. And now, um, through two years, we've received over 11,000 from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And you see some of the key sort of indicators about the data. 60% of those who've reported to us are women, so it appears, at least from our data, that they are bearing uh, quite a bit of the brunt of anti-Asian hate also youth in significant numbers and seniors. And what we see also is that about um, you know, 70 plus percent are, it, take place in those spaces that are open to the public, parks, streets, as well as businesses. And so you know, we've, when we think of and delve into the data, right, what's the who, what's the what, and what's the where? So we see that, um, and in fact, I apologize that we couldn't include all the data in terms of ethnicities. While you know, a large number are East Asian and specifically Chinese, Korean, and Japanese American, also Southeast Asian, Korean, and Vietnamese as well, sorry, Filipino and Vietnamese uh, have experienced it in significant numbers. Even South Asians have reported to Stop AAPI Hate, about 2% or so, and uh, Pacific Islanders also have experienced hate that looks similar to uh, East and Southeast Asians. Um, when we think of the what, it is largely verbal harassment, um, though we know that there also are a number of physical assaults, civil rights violations, as well as avoidance and shunning. And then finally, the where. I mentioned just now that it's um, in all of those public spaces, and what's notable is to public transit, as well as schools, um, are some of those places where we see um, the hate taking place. So the key takeaways are racial discrimination affects all Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Intersectionality matters, and that's why we see the, the gender component as well. Most of these are hate incidents and not hate crimes. So that's a really important point because unfortunately mainstream media has focused only on the most violent, which are criminal acts, but they make up only about 15%. So 85% are not crimes, which then begs the question, do we actually need more law enforcement or policing? No, what we need is more comprehensive solutions. And that racism is not only interpersonal, but systemic, institutional, and reinforced through policies. I want to also note that um, another 
uh, misperception is that most perpetrators are African American, and that's simply not the case. They come from all communities. And when we hear folks say that, we know that that comes from a place of unfortunate anti-blackness that um, is present in our communities. So we need to really look at um, you know, ways in which our communities have been impacted. And as you know, I pointed out 11,000 incidents, it's really only the tip of the iceberg because the Pew Research Center found that 45% of our community members have experienced something. That means eight to 10 million individuals. And when we look at the reasons why we see political rhetoric being a key reason, and of course, as was mentioned in a question in the last panel, uh, attacks against uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu, as well as Dominic, Dominic Ng from East West Bank, being um, called disloyal, um, and Lance Gooden, a uh, Republican congressman from Texas, saying that the FBI even should investigate these folks, right? Um, we also know that policies drive uh, much of the hate, and so mass deportations of Southeast Asians, programs like the China Initiative, the 9-11 surveillance and profiling of South Asians. Um, and what it has led to really is uh, what we found in a report we call the blame game, that one in five of the incidents reported to us include this kind of scapegoating, right? So around public health, we saw that back in the days of the bubonic plague, where Chinese Americans were blamed for the disease, national security, and of course then the Japanese incarceration and 9-11 profiling, and economic um, insecurity and anxiety, which we know happened with the uh, horrible beating death of Vincent Chin. So now past has become prologue. And so as we think of future provocations, what I think that we've come to understand as our populations are growing is that we are also beginning to see ourselves as racialized, right? Uh, Lonnie Guineer, a uh, noted civil rights uh, leader and scholar, talked about the racial ladder, where whiteness is at the top and blackness at the bottom. So where does that put Asian Americans? Uh, in terms of the outsider framing, the idea of the perpetual foreigner, right? So where are you from? Where are you really from? Are those questions we get even if we're third, fourth, fifth generation? Um, and then that leads, of course, to uh, questions of loyalty um, and, you know, are we actually American? And then, of course, um, the model minority myth. And I just want to take a quick second to... Um, describe this. How many folks have heard of the model minority myth? Many individuals don't know, despite having heard of it and sadly wearing it as a badge of honor, that it was coined in 1966 by Professor Peterson at Berkeley, and he really juxtaposed Asian Americans versus African Americans, saying, oh, look at how well Asian Americans have done versus uh, black Americans, not accounting for slavery and Jim Crow. He also said, Asian Americans were a model because we kept our mouth shut, because we didn't talk about Japanese incarceration, right? Which isn't true, in fact, but he blamed black Americans for, in fact, the civil rights movement, for questioning secondary status uh, as Americans. And so this is a good reason why we should um, really throw it off, right? We shouldn't accept this type of uh, framing and in fact, we haven't. When we look at the resistance and resilience of our communities, we see it as part of the civil rights movement. We see it with uh, resistance of uh, World War, War II incarceration, the farm worker movement, and Larry Itliong's contribution, the Third World Liberation Front post 9-11, um, organizing, and then more recently, Asians for Black Lives, as well as efforts to build solidarity for our communities. And here are just a few photos you see, um, and uh, those are actually my family members, my two daughters and husband, who are out um, uh, as part of Asians for Black Lives, 
Um, and then this one uh, at the bottom, the uh, Women's March in 2017 um, to really advocate for women's rights. And then this last one here in Koreatown where you had ummas and uppas, uh, titas and titos, uh, nenas and yeyes, all out there, multi-generational, saying we're not going to accept anti-Asian hate. Um, and so when we think then um, of civic engagement, right, which is what our communities so desperately need, and unfortunately our past tells us we haven't been as engaged as we could be. Now in 2020, we are seeing our community members more enthusiastic about voting than they ever have. Um, we see that we play a role at, in the margin of victory. So even though our populations are still relatively small, in Virginia, in New Jersey in 2017, in Georgia in 2020, we made the difference for those candidates who won and we're continuing to do so. Um, and so as I close, I want us to think about really um, how our voices are needed. I dare say that what we are seeing is um, really the advent of authoritarian fascism in America today. Um, and it's not the first time, right? We saw it with Joseph McCarthy and what was done in the 1950s. And now we see it with the alien land laws being introduced in five different states, Texas, Montana, Georgia, and Virginia, where individuals who are non-citizens um, are, but are Chinese and of other ethnicities being denied the right to buy property, right? We're seeing mass voter suppression across our country, the banning of books, the telling of Japanese incarceration as a good thing, right? Um, and the Holocaust is non-existent. We are seeing the el full-scale elimination of reproductive rights. Just this week, San um, South Carolina introduced a bill to uh, issue a, the death penalty for women who seek an abortion. And sadly, the never-ending gun violence, we, which we ourselves experienced in San Gabriel and sadly in Monterey Park. And so what can you do? Encourage those you know to report anti-Asian hate. We are the nation's leading aggregator of this data. Um, go to our website to check out resources and reports absolutely critical that folks vote um, and engage civically, right? Write to your congressperson, go to meetings at City Hall, um, and run for office, right? We need more representation across our land if we are to have a powerful voice. So with that, um, I wanna leave you with this quote. You cannot change any society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. From one of our noted um, sisters in the struggle, Grace Lee Boggs. Um, so I look forward to your questions uh, at the end. Thank you again for inviting me um, to speak today. Uh, again, a wonderful event, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you. Hello, what's up everybody? Uh, Jimenez Lai here. Uh, what a great honor to be here with you all and uh, I really loved today's presentations. It was just uh, so riveting. It got me thinking about so many things. Uh, I mean, so for example, during Wendy's talk, I think I was almost brought to tears. And, uh, or, you know, early on when uh, Gordon was talking, I was just thinking about uh, the idea that, you know, let's say physical muscles that represent the hardware of modernization gets uh, the Trotsky treatment erased uh, so that the representation of history is through the minds of the people who are making, uh, who are not a part of the, let's say, muscles. Uh, or later on when um, Jane was talking, uh, I, I kept thinking, uh, later, I even asked her about it, you know, it made me wonder, while I'm not surprised if Homer Simpson would have voted for Trump, I wonder about Ned Flanders. But I think it was also really striking earlier on was uh, uh, seeing the talk of uh, both uh, 
Marcy and Naomi, uh, because prior to today, I, I was unaware of the work of uh, Toshio Aoki. Uh, but uh, in being exposed to it, I, th I think, you know, uh, today I will be showing you uh, a collection of the work that I've done over the years. Uh, and with it, hopefully, at the end, I'll, I'll kind of ask uh, a bit of a question about um, the, the word future. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, implicitly, I, 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 you know, while I live in this world and you know operate in this society, I sometimes wonder, do I, uh, what, how, like, what, how Asian is my work? Sometimes I think about this, uh, but I think I have a bit of a, an answer. But before I do that, I'll just show you a number of things. For example, this installation work uh, was titled "Another Primitive Hut." Um, for a media company. I had a chance to represent Taiwan at Venice Biennale uh, a few years ago where I got to deconstruct the domestic diagram and turn every room into a house. Uh, so the interiority of the house was more of an interior urbanism uh, and each house got turned into a character, right? So the living room was a character, the bathroom was a character, and, and so forth. Uh, the range of the things that I, I've done, I mean, I wear very many hats. I teach, I teach at USC. Uh, but I also design, yes, things that look like buildings, but things also uh, appear to be more like objects, including this lamp uh, called Scribble, uh, which uh, luckily was collected by LACMA, or other installation art proposals, uh, such as this uh, proposal to build at MoMA PS1 uh, to hang a, hang a bunch of pools, uh, Californian pools. Uh, on my PS1. But uh, although the Californian pools were never built, uh, I got to hang a bunch of pool-like objects at Coachella. So this was a few years um, ago. I got to construct this project called the uh, Tower of 12 Stories at Coachella. And, you know, the composite nature of, uh, let's say, you know, adding buildings to buildings, uh, building buildings between buildings, uh, adding I guess buildings behind buildings, or within buildings. Uh, I think there's a maybe a implied referentiality to the types of work I do, and it, it could be also because you know, as an Asian, uh, I always wanted to be a good student, and you know, just make sure I read my references uh, all the time. So even in the these kinds of building proposals that we've done in the past. Um, uh, for the people who know the references, they'll they'll find it right. Like it's kind of, kind of like. Uh, embedding Easter eggs within uh, within even architecture, like embedding Easter eggs even within architecture. But speaking of Easter eggs and you know um, architecture, I I, I want to maybe uh, dwell on these two images a little bit. Uh, it might be surprising that as a person trained in architecture, my first publication was actually a graphic novel. Uh, I drew a whole comic book. Uh, manga was such a big part of my um, childhood. Uh, I read, you know, so many different uh, varieties of comics uh, th uh, throughout my childhood to, to, a, to a point where uh, the way in which I saw the world, it was as though the whole world was a deconstructed uh, comic book, including the computer that's in front of me, the screen that's in front of me, the televisions are, that are around me, the advertisements, the billboards, the facades, the windows, all of which are comics. Uh, comics, you know, sometimes they are... Uh, literally articulated graphically as though they are, uh, you know, uh, design comics. But sometimes it is just a door, uh, a portal into somebody else's life. So cartoons about architecture was this first, uh, you know, uh, type of work. Uh, and manga, uh, uh, as, a, as a way of thinking, might have been... But that also meant that cartoon was the medium and architecture was the subject matter. But later on, I started uh, grappling with the uh, the other side of the spectrum, which is, which is cartoonish architecture, where architecture is the medium. I'm drawing plans, sections, site plans, but the sensibility uh, is cartoonish, right? Uh, I, I remember I had a chance to present this work in front of uh, Denise Scott Brown, who's a really important architect, and she did ask, you know, did you study calligraphy? I didn't know how to answer that, but may maybe... I just read a lot of comics and people who drew uh, and were influenced, such as uh, Toshio Aoki. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on any of these things. I'm just going to fly through them because of time. These are just a, a, a number of things that I've built over the years. Uh, 
including this piece, which was recently completed, uh, well, it was temporary installation in front of the city hall uh, at Grand Park. And I had a chance to collaborate with a musician uh, where we treated this thing more of a, as an oversized instrument. Uh, so the cavity above the structure that you're seeing, uh, there, there we embedded an amplifier so that people can whisper their sorrows into the structure uh, and you know it gets uh, distorted into nonsense. <laughs> and that's the inside, inside of this uh, confession booth. Um, and you know, I think I think uh, both both Naomi and uh, Marcy briefly touched on the yokai culture, which may may have influenced the, the mythology, Japanese mythology culture, which may have influenced later on what became manga, right? But I've always thought of architecture as the creatures in themselves. Um, and so more recently, we were even, which, this is weird that we get hired to do this type of stuff. Uh, we were hired to kind of uh, design some AR, VR creatures that walk along Grand, Grand Avenue. Uh, and so this is somebody who's kind of taking our creatures into the virtual world. But in terms of deconstructing comics and storyboards, uh, more recent design work uh, that we've been doing, we've even look, we've been looking at houses uh, as comics, right? Like if you were to think of slices of life, the slices of comic stories, uh, and, and you piece them back together, uh, I'm happy to report that some of these things are actually getting built uh, under construction, which is great. This is the last slide, uh, and it's a sl slide about a uh, murder mystery. But, you know, Again, why would a person who study architecture do all this? You know, why would I wear so many hats? I even write uh, for t TV episodes these days. But maybe the, th the thing I want to say about the quote unquote, uh, the word future uh, is that the design education, especially architecture, is a multimedia education. Uh, and, you know, just because we design buildings doesn't mean we don't think about uh, how to speculate upon the world. And I think it's a really appropriate way to channel wherever you're from. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm proud to be an Asian person. And, you know, there are times that inadvertently I see uh, these kinds of deep-seated uh, Asian influences uh, conveyed in these ways. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Can you see me? I'm having a hard time. I, I think we, you really do need a stool here. There's been a few of us that uh, can't quite see over the podium. Um, I'm Karen Wong. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you um, to the Huntington for inviting me. I actually realize almost everybody here has written a book or is coming out with a book, and I feel like I might be the token doesn't have a book coming out person. So thank you for giving me that slot. Um, I am just going to say a few things because I know we want to pivot to having a conversation with each other and with all of you. Um, and so I'll just say, I actually only have a couple of slides and um, I'm a little embarrassed. I think I actually have like the Google, I have like the PowerPoint template. So I really admire um, my, my colleagues who have put out such um, beautiful slides. But I have a couple of points I wanted to make. And, and the irony when I was putting this together is I am actually not at all a numbers person. Um, I am terrible with numbers. <laughs> and I went to law school for a reason because I wanted to kind of work with words and not numbers. But I have numbers to share today because I think they, illustrate a dichotomy that I want to kind of talk about um, with respect to the Asian American community at this moment. And it's going to touch on some of what we've already heard about in this panel today and earlier today. Um, the first set of numbers actually picks up a lot of what um, Manju actually talked about just um, a few minutes ago. Um, and I, I highlight these numbers because I think that we are in a moment of um, kind of a, 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 a widespread moment of, of racialization for many Asian Americans. And she talked about this a little bit. I really liked the chart that she showed, um, you know, with white on top and black on the bottom, whiteness and blackness, and then kind of the insider outsider, and where do Asian Americans fall in that. Um, you know, as non-Western, non-Europeans living in a predominantly Western 
uh, European society, Asian Americans often have a moment, some point in our life, when we realize that we are racialized. Um, for those of us that are born or raised here, sometimes that doesn't come immediately. Um, and you know, that where we, you know, where we finally grapple with the fact that we're not the majority, we're not white, that we are you know, forever perpetually foreign. Um, you know, it happens at different times. For me, uh, it actually took place, you know, I um, have lived in LA area now for longer than anywhere else um, that I've lived. Um, but I, I think where you grow up has such a fundamental impact on you that I, if I'm asked, I always identify as being, you know, from the Midwest. So I, I was, my parents were immigrants from Taiwan and they, they ended up, unfortunately for me, in, in, in Indiana, which is where I spent most of my childhood, um, in a small town where people actually, well, it was a small city, not really a small town, but people, like, would ask me things like, are you Mexican? Like, they just didn't know what to make of me as, a, as an immigrant child um, from, you know, my parents were from Taiwan. This is in the 1970s in, in Indiana. And then they moved um, to suburban Chicago, which, to be quite honest, was actually not that much better. It wasn't, it wasn't Chicago. It was like the far west suburbs. Um, and so for me, my moment of racialization took place in college when I went to University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. And it, it, you know, for those of you familiar with the colleges here, the Asian American community, um, now looks a little bit more like it does at a place like UCLA or Irvine. Um, back then, there were a lot of Asian American students, but it was nothing like it is in California. But for me, as a child that grew up in Indiana, it was remarkable. <laughs> you know, I met other Asian Americans, other second gen, first gen Asian Americans for the first time. And the moment for me of realizing who I was and what I was was when we brought a filmmaker named Renee Tajima Pena, that some of you may know. Um, she, she works and teaches here at UCLA as well. She made a documentary called Who Killed Vincent Chin? And we heard and Chin referenced earlier this morning, um, this documentary about this um, kind of uh, kind of watershed hate crime against an Asian American in the early 1980s um, was made into a documentary that she co-made, and we brought her to talk about it. And I said, I remember sitting. Um, I remember very little bit about very little about college, but I remember sitting in this dark room um, watching this film and really having, you know, light bulbs like an electric shock go off for me, and think and realizing as I watched the story unfold of a Chinese American mistaken for a Japanese American, and then he lost his life. He was clubbed to death, um, you know, by two white auto workers. Um, you know, because of his perceived race or ethnicity um, and his being Asian, um, that it really kind of crystallized for me all these things I felt as an as a, as a, as a Asian American growing up in white middle America where I, was, I faced, you know, daily microaggressions where people would write things like Jap and chink in my middle school yearbook. And at the time, I had no way to understand what that meant. My parents were immigrants. They didn't know what that was. And I knew it didn't feel quite right, but I couldn't quite articulate, you know, what, what this was. And so for me, watching that film and being able to kind of understand, you know, um, you know, like, you know, this could have been me, this could have been my parent, could have been someone in my family. Um, it really um, uh, opened a door for me to understand that, you know, this is actually how I want to spend my life, is to work on, on these issues of justice around race. Um, and it was that moment of, of kind of understanding my race and my place in, in this society. Um, and so I bring this up because that was the moment for me, but I think what was interesting in spring of 2020, um, I was working at UCLA at the time, and I was not actually working explicitly in an Asian American space right now, but starting to see um, all the hate that was unfolding and being reported um, in the news. Um, and that actually, you know, I think I, I was observing, um, you know, what seemed like a moment of, of, of understanding our racial space as Asian Americans, for many Asian Americans who up until these last few years may not have really had to grapple uh, with that. And so I included a few numbers here, some of which you already heard from Manju, like the 11,467, you know, incidents reported in a two-year time. Um, a couple other things that have jumped out at me over the last few years, and I think these are underreported numbers, is, you know, some studies say one in three, some say one in five, but a, 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 a large number of Asian Americans in the last few years have said they have ex been experiencing discrimination or anti-Asian harassment for the first time. Um, the chart that's here actually talks, Manju referenced, there's a distinction between incidents and crimes. Um, even if you look at um, anti-Asian hate crimes, which is um, uh, activity that actually breaks a law and moves into the area of criminal activity, um, that is, is highly undercounted. That's always been an issue. I think that's why Stop AAPI Hate and others now collect incidents more broadly. But even if you look at just hate crimes, that spiked. Um, and this is data, I think, from um, the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism. 
Sam at Cal State University San Bernardino. They do a lot of great work tracking hate. Um, it jumped 150% at a time when hate crimes overall were going down. So hate crimes against Asian Americans skyrocketed when hate was actually plateauing. Um, so I feel like it's important to recognize that you know this moment in the last few years has been a moment of kind of racial awakening or you know an understanding of our racialization as Asian Americans. Um, the dichotomy I wanted to mention, and I'm just going to talk about two, um, uh, these are examples, so not so much to pick on these, but the, you know, I work in the law, um, my sister and both her in law are in medicine, a lot of my friends are, so these are two I'm very familiar with, and I bring up this idea of privilege, because while at the same time that we are being racialized and targeted for violence and hate, um, we have to recognize that Asian Americans are also occupying um, you know, important spaces of privilege. Um, the two charts here, and I tried to um, show like the yellow highlights show where Asian Americans are situated in these two professions. In law, on the left, that's the, um, somewhere here there's a, sorry. Okay, I don't know if the laser is working, but um, the chart on the left is, is, the, is the legal profession, which I'll explain in a second. The chart on the right is the medical profession. Um, so what I think is, is interesting is that um, while the data here is aggregated, um, so it's Asian Americans uh, in one category, just Asian Americans as a lump group, and the other side is Asian Pacific Islanders um, without breaking out ethnic data, I do think, you know, to Linda Vo and other points about there's diversity in our community, this data hides the fact that even if we have a lot of Asian Americans in these two professions, which is what I'm going to talk about um, before I wrap, um, we are missing, you know, we're missing a lot of people in, the, in, in our community within these numbers. So these are not equal representations of people across the Asian American and Pacific Islander spectrum. But putting that aside, I do think the contrast is extremely striking and something that I feel like this is where our communities add. And if we're talking about the future, we have to recognize the places where we have power and we have privilege. Um, at, on the left side with the legal sector, lawyers are, you know, amongst the most powerful and wealthy members of our society. You know, the, not only are lawyers lawyers, but they're judges, they're elected officials, they're running government agencies. Agencies, they're often in business. Um, legal sector has a serious racial diversity issue. Um, nationally, the sector is overwhelmingly white. Only 14% of lawyers nationally are people of color. Um, and that's in a population, you know, that's hugely underrepresented across the board. I'm going to focus more on California because I think it's more relevant to us here today. California is better in terms of our diversity. Our um, California lawyers are about one third, 32 percent, coming from different communities of color, um, and uh, that is is um, we're a more racially diverse state, so that you would expect California to be better than the national average. California is about 60 percent people of color, 37 percent um, white, so it's still it's still not uh, equal representation, but it is better than the national numbers. But the reason I put the chart I put here up is because um, California, um, 32 percent of California lawyer people color. The largest group by far is that top bar, and that's Asian Americans. And even though if you look at the top, Asian Americans have plateaued. There have been several studies coming out. Asian Americans, for whatever reason, were going to law school in droves around the time I started going, and then it plateaued over the last few years. But we're still the largest group. When people say, oh, the legal profession is becoming more racially diverse, we have to recognize as Asian Americans that we are occupying a lot of that diversity, and it is not equally being spread to African Americans, to Blacks, to Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Latinos. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that, and, and you can't see that, I, I realize that you can't see the full chart, but Asians are the top, and the next few categories um, down are, um, I think, uh, multiracial, um, uh, I'm sorry, Hispanic, multiracial, and Black. Those are the, the, the four lines that you can see on top. Um, for medicine, um, I think this is maybe less surprising because we, there are a lot of stereotypes about Asians, especially East Asians, South Asians being in the field of medicine. Um, but I do think it's important to highlight this is another sector that is economically and socially uh, advantaged in our society. Um, and there are um, improvements in the number of people of color in medicine. Right now at the national level, 62% of doctors are white. Um, in California, uh, there's actually a lot of doctors who um, declined 
to give their race. It's actually 18 percent, um, but a very large per percentage are white. Um, the largest is 30, uh, I think it's 34 percent, 33 percent. The next largest is Asian, Pacific Islander, 32 percent. Um, so, when, and this is compared to 6 percent of Latino, 3 percent black, both of those populations hugely underrepresented. So again, when we talk about diversity in one of our most powerful and highly respected professions, um, yes, it is becoming more racially diverse over time, but it's actually Asian Americans who are taking up a lot of that space. So I'm going to end because I'm getting my time's up sign. Um, I swore I, I I practiced this and I swore it was less than 10 minutes. Um, but uh, the, 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 I guess the thoughts I will leave us with is that, you know, Asian Americans, you know, I, I started with the part about the hate crimes because Asian Americans are, are clearly viewed not as white. We've never been viewed as white by people who are not Asian. But I think Asian Americans, um, because, you know, that is, that is the, that, that is the, the, the polarized system that we come into in this country is that you, as you aspire to be the status quo, which is white, or, you know, or you, you end up being non-white, which is not desirable from a political standpoint. And I think the, the racial awakening, the racialization that's happening with, with hate is making a lot more of our community come to grips with the, term, with the idea that you know, we are racialized in this country. Even if we aspire to be more like people who are white, to be closer to the status quo and, 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 the, and the existing power structures, we are, that, that is not us. We are not viewed that way. Um, and then I bring up the second set of numbers because we do have some privilege here um, as a community Community. Not all of us, but many of us do. And, you know, it, I guess the, the provocation for the future is as we you know, move forward as Asian Americans, how are we going to think of ourselves in terms of where we sit in the American kind of racial landscape? You know, are we going to continue to strive to be part of the status quo, or are we going to say we have a moment and perhaps some ability and power to be able to say, you know what, we are actually part of this larger um, set of communities of color. We have um, c come into this country and been able to access these professions because of the civil rights movement, because of of our black brothers and sisters who broke down the immigration barriers that kept us out for decades. You know, what are we going to do to use our positions of racial privilege um, in some of these places where we have it and be able to um, to move forward and advance you know, racial justice and equity for not just Asian Americans, but for other communities of color as well. And so I welcome um, hearing from my co-panelists and from all of you um, after this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, everybody's like, good afternoon. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be a little bit livelier in a little bit here. Um, uh, what uh, I'm gonna try to do here is to offer a provocation that's a little bit different. Um, but first, just say thank you to the Huntington. Uh, thank you to Yinchi, uh, Michelle, uh, Alice, uh, to the staff of the Huntington, to Gordon, to all of you who curated and put this to get together, uh, and to all of the panelists, some of my favorite writers, some of my favorite activists, uh, advocates, artists, organizers. It's been a really, really inspiring day. Um, so as the last presenter today, I guess, um, with my provocation, I was actually busily rewriting it through the entire session today. Um, because I was actually provoked by uh, Mr. Simon Lee's provocations this morning. Uh, he asked two questions, actually, for us to try to examine. The first is, what is the desirability of, of uh, the term Asian American now, right? Um, and especially uh, given the reminders that Manju and Karen just put before us that we're living through this context of anti-Asian violent, uh, violence, which has made this idea of Asian American actually more relevant than ever. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And uh, the second question was, what is the role of representation in helping to advance us? And all of those who us, of us who are, are uh, writers, we all look up to Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, we know that uh, there is more representation before, um, but we also recognize that we're nowhere near what Viet uh, calls on the culture industries to create, which is narrative 
plenitude, right? The diversity of our stories being out there. So I want to try to dive into those questions because my obsession over the last year, to now I should say the last two, three years as we've been moving through this pandemic and this increase in violence is, can we create a narrative? Can we create a narrative of Asian America that can take us through the next 50 years? Can we take uh, a narrative, can we create a narrative of Asian America that can take us through the next 50 years? Because there's sort of a sense of disorientation, pun intended, around the term Asian American now. And I mean, for those of us who uh, were raised on the narrative of Asian America, born in the, uh, being born in the 1960s in battles against war, against racial segregation, against violence, uh, against exclusion. Um, and we utilize, we we're taught to utilize that term Asian American as a, as a term of a will to power almost, right? To, to uh, use it as a banner for recognition, for representation. But I'm also aware, because I'm with young people all the time, that amongst younger people, there's uh, a sense of what even is an Asian American anymore? Am I Asian American? How am I Asian American? In what way am I Asian American? Um, and there's a fair amount of that uh, doubt that they have about it as they're trying to think about it. And of course, in this moment, of course, right, when we're fearful to walk out on the streets sometimes, it becomes an existential question. Um, so again, Asian American is a term that was uh, invented in the 1960s. It was a provocation. Uh, people called us Oriental, which is meaning somebody from the East. I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. The Far East to me was New York City, right? <laughs> so instead, and, and as, uh, as we were hearing earlier from Marcy, right? Like, no, most of you all are east of the Pacific, right? So east, west, we weren't oriental. We were going to center ourselves as Asian Americans. So it was a provocation. And it was also an assertion, an assertion that we belong together. All of these folks who are coming from different types of histories and backgrounds to come to this, this place, right, that despite all our differences in language, in culture, and the fact that oftentimes our histories were fraught with conflict with each other, that we actually belonged together, right? That we shared something essential, which is this shared history of oppression uh, and one which we shared with other racialized minorities, right? So that's what we're seeing uh, in this particular picture here, which I wanna talk about in a second. This is, well, let's talk about it now, why not? So this is a picture by Corky Lee. Um, Corky Lee, the, the late, great, amazing documentarian and photographer and uh, artist of the Asian American movement, the Asian American struggle, uh, the Asian American identity. And this photo was taken in 1975, nearly 50 years ago, where elder women were joining these protests that were happening in New York's Chinatown, um, protesting against police brutality uh, against Chinese Americans, specifically a brutal beatdown of a young man named Peter Yu. But they used this as a platform to actually also begin to protest for affirmative action in government building con construction jobs. So Ken Chen reminds us that these workers were out in the streets with signs that said, Asians built the railroads. Why not Confucius Plaza? They weren't getting the jobs, right? Ken wrote here of this picture, I just want to quote this because he's a brilliant writer and he just, he captures it. He says, both women emanate a sense of their own power and individuality. The elderly woman, a woman, stout face, powerful, surveys the scene. Her hands clasp around a placard that says in Chinese, down with racist oppression, justice for Peter Yu now, unite and fight to victory. Her younger companion stands with labels wide, uh, fashion of that time, I said that, Ken didn't say that. Her glance angled and her leg cocked out, a posture I associate for some reason with the 70s. Her sign says in English, minorities unite fight for democratic rights. And this has been the narrative that's driven many of us. It's been 
driving us to have this incredible outpouring that's lasted more than 50 years of creative energy, the building of an infrastructure of social service and civil rights organizations, the building of cultural institutions, of community centers, of film festivals, of writing groups, of art workers, right, coming together. The need for representation, but the need also to be able to name ourselves, to tell our stories to each other, uh, to continue to build this narrative of Asian America. But also to be able to build so that we can move towards material gain, right? So the movement for the expansion of rights, to remove barriers of discrimination, to move us all towards political representation, towards real equity. Something that Karen's second um, slide actually has us question. Now, however, of course, in part due to the same trends that Jane talked about earlier in terms of migration and immigration, the notion of Asian American feels the burden of containing an impossibly massive uh, diversity, right? A bewildering diversity. And the breadth of our class, geographic, gender, social, historical, and also now, perhaps, because we're still mostly uh, on the left side uh, of the column, political positions. Our identities are vastly different. Our day-to-day -day realities are vastly different. Conflicts and fissures that were already there uh, are uh, intensifying sometimes. There's new ones. Asian Americans are the most diverse of all racial groups in all categories, and to put a finer point on it, the most internally stratified. So when Viet asks for narrative plenitude, it doesn't only seem as if it's a call to the white dominated culture industries and social institutions, it is, but it also seems like he's asking for narrative plenitude for us as a way for us to actually make sense better sense of the full diversity of our stories. But at the same time, violence is bringing us all back together. And let's, for the last time today, check out this idea of mistaken identity, right? Mistaken identity. Vincent Chin was killed because he was Japanese. You have young folks, Manju was talking about being mistaken for Chinese, right? As Linda Vo mentioned, Vietnamese folks are being told to go back to China. But it's not that the violence makes us all Chinese. The violence makes us all Asian American. So when we say stop Asian hate, stop Asian anti-Asian violence, we can call this a negative narrative. A negative narrative meaning we're saying stop, no more of this, right? Which we have to do. We have to say stop racism. Stop these harms that are happening to us. But this narrative also has its limits. There's a danger that we actually lose people to the fears, right? Uh, that if the only thing that unites us as Asian Americans is stopping the violence, how do we actually then call them to think of Asian American in a positive type of sense? We actually become susceptible to losing people to, to their fears, right? Their fears of violence, their fears of, of with the, the Harvard admissions case, their fears of falling, right? Falling behind. And this is a narrative landscape and a cultural moment where Fear is what gets amplified. That's what the algorithms amplify. Uh, that's what uh, the intensity of the moment amplifies. Fear is what gets amplified. And what this creates is what the writer Anne Anlin Cheng calls Asian pessimism. And it shows up in this sort of Asian uberales type of cry of the anti-affirmative action forces who are actually working to resegregate K through 12 in higher education and cut off educational opportunity to black and brown people. It shows up in the nihilistic, toxic, masculinist tendencies and aesthetics of the politics of uh, internet groups like the men's right Asian groups. It shows up in pro-punishment, pro-carceral politics of many Asian Americans. The problem is that the narratives that address fear can also do the work of amplifying more fear and that that then makes us more isolated. So, when we ask what kind of narrative of Asian American can help us meet the challenges that we now face and propel us into the next 50 years, what we're also asking is, is there a positive narrative of Asian America that can bring us together? That's about what we're for. That's about what values we stand for, right? One that we can co-create. One that folks feel drawn to. One that fe folks feel joy uh, out of. Uh, that they want to join, that will increase solidarity uh, with others who are feeling pain instead of increasing harm to them. So, enter. 
everything everywhere all at once, which actually is a great description of Asian American identity at this very point in time, <laughs> right? Narrative plenitude all in one movie. So what's offered is this idea of the multiverse as a primary experience of immigrants and the descendants of immigrants, right? The choices that are made, the paths that are not taking, but also this bewildering diversity that we have to talk about, right? How do we make sense of all this, right? Uh, and the biggest threat to this, the everything bagel of Asian American identity is Asian American pessimism, which is represented by the character of the younger generation, whose name is Joy, which is what she's trying to find, but she can't, and so she turns into Jobu Tupaki, right? Who's somebody who is gonna take us uh, to total destruction. She's confused about identity. She doesn't have language or concepts to work through it. She's above all outraged. She's feeling neglected, excluded, isolated. She's always feeling threatened. And of all the Evelyns, of all the Michelle Yeos, right, of all the Evelyns who can actually cure it, it's the failed Ev Evelyn who can do that because she best understands what it means to lose, right? She's the one who can understand what it means to rectify the hurts and the harms and to reconcile. And so, uh, my time's up. We'll talk about this some more. But just to say, how do we form this new narrative that's not just about saying no, but what do we say yes to? And what can we all say yes to, right? How can we recognize the harms that have been perpetrated against us and not re-harm others because of that, right? But how does that help us to think about uh, what we might move to that can lift us all up together? All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much to um, the panelists. And I know each one of you could have spoken for an hour <laughs> and it would have been amazing and fascinating. So appreciate um, these short provocations which really can launch us now into this discussion. And so um, I have a few questions that I'd like to start to pose to all four panelists and then we're definitely going to get to um, folks in the audience ASAP. But I just wanted to start with actually building on some of the things that Jeff has just kind of put forth and allow the other panelists to kind of respond. Um, and, you know, I'm struck by the image of Corky Lee and um, this moment of the beginning of the term, the origin of the term Asian American, and that was one of the things that Simon Lee brought up at the beginning of the day. Um, and I guess my question for all of you that Jeff kind of started us on is, um, you know, to what extent are we, should we kind of recreate this moment of the beginning of the Asian American movement? Um, and we are still using that term. And so I invite you to also respond to the question of whether, you know, we need a new term um, or whether this term is still serving us well. And if we're not kind of um, taking direct inspiration from that moment, what are the demands of this current moment that are different than the demands of 1968 um, and the beginning of the Asian American movement? And you know, in this bewildering, everything everywhere, post-pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter uh, kind of era, um, what, what kind of movement can we positively build as Jeff was uh, sort of gesturing towards and how might that look different than the civil rights movements? of the past, um, or build on them, or both. <laughs> so, mic drop. <laughs> um, and uh, to put it maybe more concisely, um, how do you see the current moment as differing from the kind of late 1960s origins of the Asian American movement? <laughs> Whomever. <laughs> It's on, yep, it's on. 
Um, okay, I guess I'm being nominated um, to go first. Um, I mean, I, I was actually one of the things I was going to say and I didn't say is I do think it's a good time to, I feel like everything is cyclical. So even if you look at anti-Asian violence, you know, there have been cycles of it and people who live through each cycle, I think we talked about the LA Chinatown massacres and then more recently there's been like the eight, 1980s, 1990s Vincent Chin era, um, I think driven by fear of Asia and Japan, um, you know, post 9-11. Um, so, I mean, things come in cycles, and so I, I actually, on one hand, really feel like it's great to go back and revisit kind of the beginning of, of that kind of 1960s, 1970s Asian-American movement and the claiming of a pan-Asian term as a political identity. I think, I've, I'm sorry, I forgot who said that this morning, but I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I also think someone else said this, and I do think the difference now um, is a little bit related to the second slide I showed, which is, you know, there are more Asian Americans now, um, even if they don't identify, or even if we don't identify as Asian American, um, and we also occupy more places of power and privilege, I think, that allows us to not just react, but actually help define and move forward, like, you know, advance, you know, equity and justice. So whether it's the Judy Chu's, you know, um, you know, the, uh, President Biden just nominated my former coworker and friend Julie Su to be um, Labor Secretary. I mean, we have people moving into positions um, or already in positions, and many of us, even though as a lawyer, I have a lot of privilege. You know, I don't have a title. I'm not working for President Biden, but you know, we all have privileges, and we can do more, I think, than maybe um, many of our community could do in the 60s and 70s, when much of the community was, you know, like my parents, like brand new immigrants to this country, no vocabulary or language to name the racism that they faced. So for me, you know, the, this session's about provocation. I, I want to be provocative in a sense to say that the negative and the fear that we have in our climate is actually motivating. So when you look at voter motivation, it usually is around anger and fear. It's not actually when people feel good about things. So that's unfortunate. But what that tells us is that it does drive greater civic participation. So when people feel that things are not going well, they go out to vote, they go to the ballot box. When they think things are going well, they actually don't show up, right? Um, I do think we're in a different moment because of you know, what I mentioned in my presentation, which is we are seeing fascism. I don't think we should take that lightly. Uh, versus the late 60s, which was a time of opening and growth uh, on the heels of the civil rights movement, the women's movement. That is not today. What we are seeing is a closing up of our society, a denial of wholesale rights. We actually are seeing minority rule, right? That's why women don't have bodily autonomy right now. That is why the number one um, cause of death for children and college students is gun violence, right? That is because, sadly, we're living under fascism. When you have more than 60% of Americans who are in favor of abortion rights and reproductive rights, but th those are not our laws. When you have individuals in very high numbers in both parties in favor of gun control measures and they are not reflected in our laws, you have minority rule and you have fascism. So I think for me, actually, I see fear and anger as a motivating force that can bring us to the ballot box, can bring forth greater representation and more political power. I agree, but, it, but it's a double-edged sword. And so just uh, to, to build on your point, um, what we saw in San Francisco was um, fear of crime being used by uh, agents of division, demagogues, disinformation merchants, to move Asian Americans against progressive um, um, policies with regards to criminal justice. And those are the things that keep us up at night, right? Keep, they, they keep us all up at night. And, and that's part of the, the, 
the reason that that we also have to be able to offer folks a future. So a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last five years has been looking at narrative, um, and specifically looking at narrative around immigrants and immigration. And what we learned is, is that, you know, we, we surveyed tens and thousands of folks all across the U.S. of all kinds of different types of political persuasions. And what we learned is, across the board, this is a moment where people are really feeling fear. Mm. Really feeling fear. And certainly we've seen that in our presidential elections with these record turnouts, right? Uh, they're really feeling exhaustion, and they're really feeling anxiety. Uh, the problem with, with fear in this particular political environment and this particular narrative landscape in which our technologies are actually used against us, uh, the, what that creates is further polarization, right? And that creates more and more exhaustion. But what we learned is, is we could put a lot of different narratives and messages out to folks, and you could actually win folks out over if you address their fears first. So if you have a fear of change, like you're afraid that immigrants are going to come in and take your jobs, or that kind of thing, you're afraid, you're afraid of of you're losing the values in your community, then you actually tailor your, your messages and your narrative to addressing those types of thing, things. And then after you've done that, you offer them a future that they want to buy into, that they can see themselves in. And I have to say, it's not just white folks. It's a lot of Asian American folks. It's a lot of Latinx uh, immigrants as well. It's a lot of black folks as well. We've seen the numbers in Florida and Texas uh, in in, you know, in, in brown um, areas, right, where uh, they've swung hard to the right. Um, and, and that has to do with fear. But if we can address people's fears and show them a future, so it has to be both. I think it has to be both the no and the yes. Um, and I think that that's what, what gets us there. And the question is, how do we build that yes, I think? So... Thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about how we might toggle that Asian pessimism <laughs> that you were mentioning and, you know, use this moment to mobilize politically, but then also kind of construct a vision for the future. And I know, Jeff, that you've said before in other contexts that there's, um, that that's part of the role of culture, is that this culture change kind of sometimes precedes or helps motivate a shift um, in policy or in organizing. So one thing I did want to kind of throw out to the panel, and Jimenez, maybe um, you might have a response to this, is just thinking about, you know, we have a very diverse panel here of uh, folks across law and policy, but also kind of cultural history and um, architecture and design. And so uh, throughout the presentations today, we've, um, you know, had, uh, had people commenting on, um, you know, areas outside of necessarily their specific field. And so I'm interested to hear from you all in terms of how you think about um, the relationship between kind of law and policy and uh, grassroots movements, institutional change, and then how it kind of interfaces with um, culture, imagination. Uh, I was really struck by in your presentation, Jimenez, and kind of, um, you know, the role of dreaming and things like film and helping us to do that. I just want to maybe like uh, uh, address the, maybe this question and also the previous one. Go for it. Uh, uh, when you were all talking about underreporting, uh, it is underreported because it's not 11,000 or so, it's plus one, uh, me. I did not report it. Uh, I, this was the day after Thanksgiving. I was walking home late at night. Uh, I was attacked physically, uh, struck in the face, uh, fell down, kicked in the face. Uh, uh, actually, Li Liwei's wife uh, drove me to the hospital. Uh, it was super scary. I've ne never really encountered anything like this. I lived in downtown LA for so many years. You know, I I've been robbed, whatever, it's fine, you know, but, but never been, never been, ne I mean, because I've never been beaten up uh, while being uh, called slurs. That's new to me, right? Like. And I think um, what I'm kind of maybe going back to the word fear, right? Why didn't I report? What was I? And maybe I'm also even fearful of the idea of um, labeling, if that makes sense, because you know a slur is a, is a label, and 
uh, if I'm just called one and you know sent to the hospital because of it. And I remember some years ago, I, I you know these kinds of things. Uh, in a conversation, uh, I was asked, "Where are you really from?" Right? I said, uh, "Architecture." <laughs> That's where I'm really from. <laughs> That's my identity. Uh, out of fear, right? Out of fear. Out of fear of not fitting in. Uh, out of fear of uh, being different, right? Because I think you know, in a room like that, where I was w amongst my colleagues, uh, I wanted to be a part of that room. Uh, and, and so, <clears throat> I think this is something that we probably all experienced to some degree. Um, but yeah, I just want to. I think you know, like I, with, with your parents, I mean, when you're talking about your parents, I, I can relate. So I, I remember, I'm first generation, right? I remember the day that I arrived, not speaking anything, right? Like I just. Um, and I also was uh, instructed uh, to just, like, let's say, don't stand out in either directions. Yeah. <laughs> that just, you know, like, be, be a good average, but are average better something? <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't know. I, I think that's the type of fear that I, I, uh, I think, unlike you guys, where I've, I sense the courage in you all to uh, be community leaders. Um, Sometimes I wonder about my role in that. Right? Like, maybe I don't have one. Maybe I don't have one. But going back to the role of uh, design and architecture, uh, you, I, I, there's a book that I really love, uh, so much so that it became uh, the inspiration for the name of my office, which is Bureau Spectacular. Uh, some years ago, I, I encountered a book uh, named, titled uh, On Bullshit by Harry G, uh, uh, Harry G. <laughs> Frankfurt, right? Uh, on bullshit and spoilers, spoilers alert. The the, key, the premise of the book is uh, there's a distinction between lying and bullshitting. <laughs> lying requires truth. Bullshit is something that you make. It has not not so much of a direct relationship with truth. Uh, which, when as I studied architecture, I, I recognized this idea that you know when you design something, when you make something, it is not, not an act of lying, uh, quite the contrary, which is why, you know, Bureau Spectacular, the uh, abbreviation is BS, right? I think. Yeah. <laughs> and so the idea of imagination of the future, I feel like that's what every architect, every single architect, we all, like the built environment is, uh, it requires you know, uh, the ability to speculate is something that has not existed yet, right? So how does that tie to, I mean, so when you're asking about my profession and how that ties, because, you know, like if I were to think about my identity and, you know, the, the ability to speculate and imagine and construct a future that is yet to be built, uh, perhaps, you know, it's important for me to also channel that part of me uh, to speculate that way too. Can, can, can I ask him a question? Him a, so, Jimenez, can you tell us a little bit more about, I was just really struck by the whispering structure. What? The whispering, uh, the, the structure that you whisper. Oh, am I whispering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, was that what it was called? The yeah. whispering? Oh, whispering, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us more about that? Yeah, um, so have, maybe, maybe many of you have seen this movie, In the Move for Love. So the ending sequence Only of the that, best movie yeah. ever in the entire history of film, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the ending sequence, uh, yeah, there was a sorrowful, uh, I guess, protagonist who whispered a secret into architecture and covered it with mud, right? Uh, and so that, that was really the source of, uh, source of uh, yeah. But it's just so amazing because it's a, it's a piece that helps us think about how we transform our pain into, into something beautiful it, it, even if it's meaning like on the back end it doesn't sound like anything that's meaningful but it's just beauty right um uh, because the disinformation merchants and the demagogues are doing the opposite they're they're taking whatever you whispered in in there and they're turning it around to figure out how to make money off of it and keep themselves in power can i add something yeah. so um i um I think it's really great you've had, had such diversity on this panel. I really felt like the underqualified, like, you know, good kid who went to law school <laughs> and didn't do the more interesting things. And so I, I bring that up because it's kind of a bigger answer to your question about, 
like how design or culture fits into the future of Asian America. I mean, I, I'm like my generation was. My parents were post 1965. You know, immigrants from Taiwan. I was a you know second generation. Didn't really know a lot of other Asian Americans that were not like me. And almost everybody I went to college with、um, became you know kind of the expected like accountant or doctor or lawyer. I mean, we did the things that were safe. And I actually really wanted to be a writer. I really wanted to be.、Um, I did really want art class. My parents are like, "Oh, that's really great. That could be a hobby. You know, like you need to like study and get a real job."、Um, and so I think the fact that there are so many Asian Americans now, I guess from my perspective, like doing creative things, is such an inspiration for me because my kids, you know, are 11 and they're coming later for the reception. I don't think they're here. They weren't too excited about the panel. Sorry, <laughs>、um, but you know, they're only 11. They're only fifth grade. But but I think the I think the possibility, like, so to them, it won't be like it was to me, which was I didn't actually think. There were a lot of paths for me. I felt like Asian American. You know, it was very naive, but I had immigrant parents who couldn't, you know, didn't <laughs> couldn't help me figure this out on my own. And you know, a lawyer actually seemed like a radical thing to do at the time because no, you know, very few of my Asian American friends, second gen, first gen, were actually going that way.、Um, they were mostly becoming doctors and engineers and going to work at Google and things like that. So,、um, so I do think there. So that's one piece of I think this kind of how does. Creativity in the community fit into our future.、Um, I, I will just say also that one other thing really quickly is that you know as a kind of law and policy person, you know one of the most meaningful campaigns and efforts I worked in、um, was actually not an area that I have any expertise in. It was actually around、um, uh, something that I think、um, Jane Hong mentioned earlier, but it, it was around fighting、um, uh, for uh, marriage equality in California. It's an LGBTQ gay rights issue. I don't identify with that community. I identify as an ally. But as a civil rights activist, I got drawn in, and I spent a lot of time figuring out narrative and messaging, and how do we move Asian Americans who. Don't have vocabulary understanding as immigrants、um, to understand gay rights to supporting you know their gay children, lesbian children, and their families. And、um, narrative and storytelling was so important to that.、Um, I mean, that whole campaign only got to where it did because there was a change in how we told the stories. Not so much. I mean, the law followed where the society shifted to, where media was covering the issue before the courts got there. Thank you, and yeah, it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning. Also, goes back to some of the things that came up earlier about you know artists having day jobs,、um, and、uh, you know someone like Aoki having to support himself in this economy of Orientalism in 19th century Pasadena, but also you know having time to dream and do his own、um, imaginative work.、Um, so I wanted to throw a question. Maybe Manju, you can talk about some of the recent、um, legislative. Uh, uh, Actions that you've been、um, trying to take with AAPI Equity Alliance,、um, and kind of building on what him and has shared with us about this、um, terrible experience in downtown LA.、Uh, one of the questions that came up for me today, especially in the second panel, is thinking about like urban space、um, and specifically like the ethnoburb and、um, our own kind of surrounding region of SGV and Monterey Park. And、uh, how you know both the the future of those、um, urban spaces, but also how that interfaces,、uh, Manju, with some of the work that you have done aggregating、um, these incidents, and、uh, that they often occur in public spaces or on、um, public transportation.、Um, so I'd love to hear from、uh, anyone who wants to respond about kind of. What do you see as the future of kind of urban space and、um, suburban space as well for Asian American futures? That's a great question. I mean, I can start with some of the policies that we've put forth,、um, and we've been really fortunate、um, that two of the bills that we had as part of our No Place for Hate campaign in California. Passed and were signed by the governor,、uh, and they were to look at safety in public transit and、uh, racism in retail. So those were two of the the pieces, right? I mentioned where we saw a lot of anti Asian hate,、uh, and so what we chose to do with public transit is really to begin to sort of delineate, like, what are those things that make people feel safer. Right,、um, and we talked just earlier about fear and how can we sort of overcome fear in terms of public transit,、um, and so part of that for us is not actually about law enforcement, 
but about other measures that make people feel safe, right? So gathering data on what it is that Asian Americans and all communities want when they take public transit. And you know what we've already begun to find out is you know it can mean just more lighting. It can mean more um, staff at public transit stations and stops and things like that. And so I think sort of having more comprehensive ideas of what safety looks like and building on ideas around you know affordable safe housing that's near transit right making sure that people have a living wage so that they can feel safe in their communities um, and you know not live in um, distressed housing the second piece for us was around racism in retail oh actually before I say that let me add though that it's not just public transit, actually, where our data shows that there's hate. It's also in rideshare. So I've done a number of talks for ERG groups who've said, you know what, we don't take public transit now. We only take Uber and Lyft. And actually, there's a fair amount of data that shows that drivers are also exhibiting hate in either refusing service to Asian Americans or making comments when they're actually in the vehicle that cause especially women to feel very scared and, and try to get out of the car. Anyway, back to the racism in retail. Um, using So one thing that I wanna say that's important as we think of our urban futures is when we look at incarceration versus civil rights enforcement, a key piece for me is one is forward facing and one is backward facing, right? So when we incarcerate people, we put one person behind bars and guess what? There's not a single study that shows that that prevents future hate crimes. Not one study ever <laughs> that shows that. But what we do know is when we have civil rights enforcement, ex especially against large companies, right? Walmarts of the world, Amazon, what you get often in the settlement or in the award from a, the Civil Rights Department of California, for example, is you get training, you get financial penalties on the business that motivate the vi business to change its behavior, right? And that's ultimately what we want, is we want a change in behavior across our country so that we get the future that we want to see, not only for urban spaces, but suburban and exurban and rural as well, right? That's great, and it, it sounds like, I mean, it's really interesting to hear um, that in tandem with what Jeff has worked on at the um, Immigrant Narrative Lab in terms of like how do you actually produce changes in behavior and there are different, you know, there are different ways to do that, um, whether it's through culture and narrative and storytelling or through these other kinds of more policy um, embedded uh, uh, actions. So um, I know we're approaching uh, running out of time, so I want to make sure that maybe we can bring the lights up and um, folks who have questions for the panel, we'd love to hear from you. And there is um, a microphone going around, and if it doesn't reach you, speak loudly. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sure. Thank you for today's opportunity. Thank you for all the speakers. Uh, this session is about future. Uh, AAPI equity speaker, you made a very good uh, point. It's a fascism. However, I think there is another danger, imminent danger we are facing. This country and the whole world is facing is the world peace. We are in danger. Uh, I'm a CPA, certified public accountant. I'm a CFO with uh, several company. Uh, for, I came to this country in 1987. I'm a citizen. Uh, we are sitting in this nice, warm, think about Ukrainian people, 900 million people, refugee, who caused this war. Our politicians are thinking about, oh, here, 
they did, our politicians fail to address one single issue. What's the root? How we ended up, we have a peace, world peace. And uh, every day, both sides, of course I condemn Russia invade Ukraine. Uh, we are facing another issue, it's a hot spot. It's a, now they are making embargo uh, uh, semiconductor chips to China. If we have a war between Taiwan and China, it, it will be imminent, imminent, imminent of world peace. So I strongly think about it. We need to have our. Uh, Thank you. I, I hate to interrupt you, and um, I think we've gotten a good sense of um, some of the issues that you're raising for us. And um, let's go to another question in the back. I, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you the, thank you to all of the panelists for your terrific provocations and wonderful reflections. Um, Jimenez's comment about the, the, the incident of, viol of extreme violence that he experienced and then his reflection sort of on his place in all of, it, basically in American society, brings up a question for me, and, and that is, um, what do you all see as kind of the place of non-citizen Asians going forward in the, in the 50 years that Jeff refers to of the future of Asian America? Um, you know, for example, we have so many, so many international students, at least prior to the pandemic, international students from China were on the rise, international students from all over Asia, uh, the populations were on the rise. There are so many people who are not American citizens and yet make their careers here, to a certain extent make their lives here, but ult ultimately aren't really interested in being immigrants or becoming citizens. Um, so I'm kind of curious if you might talk a little bit about um, really the future of, uh, uh, of Asians who, are, who might not necessarily identify as Asian American within um, the, this, the, the kind of future of this movement. I hope that made sense. I mean, I could start. I, I guess in terms of what this means for international students, um, I do worry because, you know, you may have seen in my slides, there are a number of efforts to actually reduce the number of um, international students coming to the U.S. Marjorie Taylor Greene and others have proposed, you know, even deporting all students or all um, sort of Chinese nationals. So I do think that there's cause for concern um, of this. And as I mentioned, the alien land laws, which are, you know, a recreation of what we had here in California and 13 other states, preventing individuals from buying property. And, you know, those can be uh, students, they can be LPRs and others. You know, I think the, the real downside when we look at, you know, this the issue that I keep bringing up around fascism, I mean, it's global, right? So it's not only what's happening here, it's happening in Hungary. We have, you know, different aspects in China and India, um, two of the largest countries in the world. And I think what international students often did was that quiet diplomacy, right, is having them here to benefit us and having them also go back right, to show the world that the United States has good ideas, we have a, a government that works, um, we believe in democracy and free speech. So I think those are some of the concerns I have globally, is what that means for efforts around the world um, to fight fascism. Um, can I add, um, I'm not sure this is responsive to the question, but just on this broader issue of the role of non-citizens and kind of the future of Asians in America. I mean, in the work that I used to do um, more than now, but, um, you know, Asian American, I think, 
for us was never, you know, in the Asian American civil rights work, it was never about being a citizen per se. So, I mean, part of this is just our laws are so horrendous for people who want to play by the rules and become citizens. It's, uh, you know, Manjita touched on this, but people who want to immigrate here and do it correctly. Um, you know, Asians have more undocumented um, people than most, I think, of us actually would expect. I mean, there are sizable numbers of undocumented, um, many are visa overstays, right? Like we have the media image of border crossing as the undocumented, but, you know, far more people overstay visas like coming through airplanes or other ports of entry, including a lot of Asian immigrants. And so, you know, I think Asian Americans isn't synonymous with Asian American citizens. And I think movements in localities to do things like give non-citizen parents some say in school boards, for example, because their children are citizens and they're participating in the community are good things. I mean, I think a future for Asian Americans should be inclusive of, you know, the different immigration statuses that are, you know, mixed families may, may hold. Thank you. All right. Any I, other burning questions yeah. out there? <laughs> I have a quick comment, actually. I, I've enjoyed this panel. It's wonderful. I just want to commend Jimenez for your courage and vulnerability for sharing your story today. Um, thank you so much for that. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I think we've, we've run out of time, but oh, one more, one more. OK, one more. Hi, I really appreciate all the uh, panelists and all the speakers today. Um, I'm just curious if um, uh, one of the six congressmen who uh, questioned Judy Chu's credibility were to invite you um, to their conference, how would you have presented uh, the same information that you have shared with us today. Uh, would you uh, do anything differently? Uh, or my question is, um, what does it take to bring about the, uh, the, 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 the most positive net gain toward uh, true equality and true peace? I guess my response to that is, there are some people you can convince and there are other people who refuse to be convinced for their own agendas, right? So what's interesting, and I actually happened to be on a panel with Congresswoman Chu just yesterday uh, in Baltimore, and what we talked about um, was the fact too that essentially we're hearing a lot more about China and the Chinese government recently because some of those in power want to exploit that for their own gain, right? So they are weaponizing racism against our communities, which is why I mentioned the scapegoating report we did. That in turn then harms us, right? Individually, it leads to the attacks, um, including the one that Jimenez experienced. And so I think we should put our efforts toward what we can achieve, uh, what we can also do to empower our own communities and realize that there's some individuals who use a particular agenda for their own ends and so at least in my book it's not worth my time and energy to spend on them because they refuse to listen to facts and reason and truth and instead they want to lead with hate and lies um, and so I would say, let's empower all of us in the room. Let's go out and vote. Let's civically engage. Let's be involved in narrative change. And I think that's how we address that issue. We don't convince them individually. What we do is we overpower them with our power and influence. I deeply agree, and I also think that it's an opportunity for us to invite our friends to show how much they really are our friends. And what I mean by that is that, uh, at, you know, during, during the uh, last presidential campaign, what we did see were a lot of Democrats actually advertising very um, anti-Chinese person, not anti-China, but anti-Chinese advertisements. These are folks who are supposed to be on our team, right? 
And so uh, this is an opportunity for us to be able to say, well, hey, if you're going to go ahead and, and issue an executive order uh, or to, to talk about anti-Asian violence, then, you know, you should be checking your own house uh, for the kinds of ads that you're putting out in Ohio, right? Um, so I think that that's part of it is we actually, as we're out there expressing our solidarity with other folks, we need to be able to invite them to be uh, in solidarity with us as well. So, yeah. So what Marjorie said and what, I, yeah. yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's a great place to end. I think the, the point of this panel was really to keep us thinking and talking about these issues and how we might move, move forward. And I take so many things away um, from everything you've all said in terms of uh, how to imagine, how to manifest, how to organize, um, how to build coalitions, uh, how to be accountable to ourselves and to each other as a community. And so... Um, thank you to these panelists and also thank you to all of the speakers today. I think we've gotten a really long range view um, and I, you've left me at least in a place of feeling um, hopeful and inspired about continuing to do the work that everyone I think who has presenting to, presented today and you know is in the room is really uh, working towards together. So thanks everyone. Thank you.